Earlier this year I talked about a game that I was pretty excited about when I was a kid. And after replaying it for that video, I came to the conclusion that it was an amazing 2D platformer with style and good writing, but it had some kinks that needed to be ironed out. I ended off that video talking about how that game's sequel was right around the corner, and at least from my experience with the demo, it seemed to have fixed every single issue I had with the original. Well, that sequel's been out for a few months now, and now it's time to ask the question of how good of a game it really is. And after 70 something hours, I'd say it's pretty damn good. Freedom Planet 2. Oh, I'm so glad it's finally here. I've been frothing at the mouth for this game since its announcement six whole years ago. Six whole years ago? Has it really been that long? Oh, man. But hey, all those six years were entirely worth it. Freedom Planet 2 is probably one of the best 2D platformers ever made. Like genuinely, if you left the gameplay out of the equation, which you shouldn't, it's fantastic, you'd be left with some of the best visuals, voice acting, story, and replay value in the genre. Freedom Planet 2, like the original, is a fast-paced 2D platformer based on the Sonic series, with a little bit of fighting game styled action thrown in there for a good mix. The three main girls, Lilac, Carol, and Mila, are back and they've received major improvements to their overall gameplay. But they're not alone, however, as Nira, the ice cop from the first game, also joins on as a fourth playable character. Lilac works very similarly to the way she did in the first game. She's the fastest one of the bunch with plenty of martial arts and special dragon abilities to help her absolutely destroy anything in her path. It's kind of crazy. And check it out, one of my biggest complaints about her in the first game has been fixed as her spin no longer takes any energy from her dash meter. That's awesome. Not really sure why she has this little dash now, but it doesn't really bother anything, so, you know, go off. And hey, now she has a power-up, which gives her a projectile. Not really sure how useful it is, because I could just run over there and hit him with how fast she is, but, you know, it's pretty cool. I like it. Carol is pretty much perfect now. She's still the brawler of the team with cool wall jumps and an infinite slash attack if you hold down the button. It's really just her basic slash, just going over and over and over again without any invincibility frames like her kick last time, but man, this move is just kind of impressive. And speaking of impressive, her new throwing disc literally solves every issue I had with Carol in the first game. Golly, it's just so cool to- did I just say golly? What the hell? Anyway, it's so cool to have a buzzsaw that cuts up your enemies and acts as a point for you to instantly jump to. Who needs that dumb bike anyway, though it is still here if you like it. It's a nice character thing for her, it's just not fun in gameplay if you ask me. And I'm glad that it's here, but by no means does Carol ever need to use it, and I appreciate that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say it, Carol is probably still my favorite to play as in this series, and now that she doesn't need the bike, she's pretty much perfect. Mila is fantastic. Last time she was so stilted and she just could not keep up with Carol and Lilac at all, especially with that puny health bar. I mean her flutter jump, alchemy skills, and digging were all interesting, but again, she couldn't really keep up. But now, a oh, holy hell man, puberty and a black belt has turned this puppy into a hellhound. She's got a full health bar now, a bunch of her own alchemy infused martial arts moves, her flutter jump is back in full force, her alchemy itself is so much better than last time as she doesn't have to slow herself down to charge something or to carry it around, and her shields and beam blocks are way better than they were last time, and her power up gives her a ton of these themes to just spam if you let her stack them up. Didn't really find any use for the digging this time around, I don't know, maybe it was because I didn't find any spots that really screamed, dig here, like in the last game, or maybe I just didn't really use it enough, I, I don't know, but I'm sure the digging's got a use somewhere. And finally, we have the newcomer, Nira. Nira is a more uh, technical fighter than the others, as she uses her spear to attack or to shoot out ice in a variety of ways. From a simple icicle to a ricocheting boomerang that freezes enemies, Ice spikes, which are really useful as they damage enemies on contact, can bounce their fire right back at them, or even as a makeshift spring for Nero to use, that's actually really cool. And finally, she's got this icy whirlwind which does a ton of damage and lets her hover upwards for a second or two. Nira is probably the most interesting character to use when it comes to boss fights because you can do a lot and be pretty creative with her different powers. Especially if you activate that little spell circle thing she's got, it actually increases the effectiveness of all of your attacks. But 
when it comes to platforming, Nira is fine, I guess? Like, really, there's nothing wrong with her. It's just that her abilities don't really lend themselves to platforming as well as the other threes. Like, sure, she can double jump and her attacks can be used to help mitigate most platforming issues she'll run into, but she's just not as fun to blast through a stage with. Like, for example, she can freeze an enemy and turn it into a platform, but by the time she gets that done, I'm long gone as any other character. I'm really trying not to say she's not good at platforming, because for 90% of the game, she's just as good as any other character. There's just a few sections every once in a while that just kind of make me miss the other three's abilities. Like, any time I had to deal with disappearing platforms, it was way more taxing than it was with any of the other characters. Like, the other three got a crutch kind of ability to make shooting past such an obstacle a breeze. While Nira kinda just has to tough it out. Nira is a great addition, just maybe tweak her a little more for the next game. Like I said, the other three were pretty much perfected for this game, so I'm sure Nira's gonna have all those little kinks worked out next time. When it comes to her power-up, I'm not really sure what it does, since she already has this limited time super state in her moveset already, which I wish didn't activate whenever I dodged with a full bar. It just kind of meant I was always wasting it, and I just didn't really find it all that useful. <laughs> Anyway, her power-up is Ice Skates, so I think they make her faster, but I'm not entirely sure. I know at this point it kind of sounds like I'm dogging on the power-ups, but honestly, I do hope they stay the way they are in this game. Because they don't really feel like they're taking an important piece of a character's moveset and making it something you have to look for. Yeah, I am still a little salty about the bike last time, how could you tell? Mila definitely has the best of the four power-ups though. Look at this Jenga Tower of Pain! Oh, and I was definitely right about this series needing a dodge button. It just completes the already good combat system. You know what's funny, I had definitely played the Freedom Planet 2 demo when it came out, but for some reason by the time I had played the game for the first video, I had pretty much forgotten everything about it. So playing that game and writing my notes for it, then going to the demo, and seeing it fixed everything, that was my first clue about how good this game was going to be. The levels themselves are all pretty interesting, with different gimmicks and fun things to do like in the last game. The only one I wasn't super into was this one late in the game because of the weird teleporter stuff and the disappearing platforms as Nira. But honestly, 1 out of 30 something stages is not bad at all. There weren't any tank levels this time around, which is a little sad but I can't say I missed them too much since we got this cool space shooter segment and oh, I don't know, maybe a Power Rangers Megazord level and boss fight, what? And you know how last time I had issues with how wonky the difficulty felt? Well, that is a complete non-issue now as you can pretty much create your own difficulty with all the items and potions and assist features. Like genuinely, it's fantastic how you can just make this game perfectly suit your playstyle because you can pretty much make it as casual or as hardcore as you want. Last time, I made a comment about how casual mode is just demeaning. I'd like to rescind that statement as it completely nullified my entire point on the topic of difficulty in games. Because I do genuinely think all difficulties in games are made with developer intention in mind. And that's exactly what's going on with these items. They really do perfectly tweak and manage the experience of the game in a way that can suit anyone's playstyle. And even if you start the game off in casual, you can just turn all those items and assist settings off and turn it to maximum difficulty by just buying more challenge stones. This system is perfect, and I hope more games take this approach for more difficulty options that cater to the experience the user wants to have with a game, while still keeping the core of what makes the game what it is. The enemies this time around are an improvement on the ones last time, which were good, but now they're way better. I'm so happy this asshole goes down like he should, unlike in the last game, where he got an anime power-up and just came at me again and again. Though, I have noticed a lot of these enemies are bird-themed, which isn't a problem, it's, it's just quite a bit of them are bird-like. I think the Sarsier's got an obsession. But speaking of flying things, we got tons of NPCs in this game based on all kinds of animals including bats and birds, and they all inhabit the different towns on the world map. 
I didn't really interact with these too much in my first few playthroughs, which was a huge mistake, as these places hold a lot of neat lore details and tons of fun power-ups, references, and may or may not hold the key to the true ending of the game. I'm being very vague because I don't want to spoil anything before we get to the spoiler section. Also, I guess this is an ASMR channel now with how much I'm doing this weird whispering in this video. Yeah, I'm really sorry if this makes you uncomfortable. I'm gonna stop it right now. Plus, there's even cool characters in the town, like this bat lady that shows up in a lot of cutscenes. I wonder if the developers are playing favorites. Though a big thing that makes these characters as cool as they are is the design work in this game. All of the characters, levels, and items are also wonderfully detailed and colorful. The sprite work in this game is amazing. It's a giant step up from the original. Oh, and how can I forget how animated everything is? Look at Carol in this scene. Beautiful. This game is so lovely to look at and watch as it animates to life, with most of the main cast's best moments being when you see them just do something absurd that completely fits their personality and it always makes me laugh. Focus! The music in this game is great, all the themes fit their stages respectively and I enjoyed quite a bit of them, with my favorite being the minor boss theme. I love how it starts with the emergency siren then halfway through the song it shifts into this cool guitar thing. Yeah, I'm not really good with music, so I'm just gonna let you listen to it. I guess all that's left now is story, which I feel is this really interesting gray area type of thing where we have our heroes trying to stop a villain who is completely justified in what they're doing but what she's doing is really awful, so they just really have to stop her. I know that's a very vague generalization of the plot, but I really don't want to spoil much of it. Well, actually, nah, let's go ham. Skip here if you want to skip spoilers, which if you ain't played the game yet, then absolutely should skip. This story is really good and you need to experience it for yourself. We start off where the last game left off, with the destruction of the Kingdom Stone after our heroes defeated Brevin. We pan down to see a water dragon pop out of the water and scream to the heavens. We then skip a few years later where we see our heroes being recruited by the Magister to help out against the ongoing robot crisis that's even destroyed the treehouse from the last game. Those motherfuckers. The girls meet up with the Magister and are sent out on three missions where they face off against a returning Serpentine and Syntax, a group of mercenaries led by Carol's sister and her partner in crime, <coughs> and an impromptu trip to the Battle Spear where the girls fight each other and a TV star hero named Captain Kalau. After these missions, the girls receive a transmission from Murga, the water dragon from before, who wants one of the drones that the girls have in their possession, so she can jumpstart Bakunawa, a spaceship who runs on moons and can kill a shit ton of people. Oh, and also if they don't give her the drone, she's gonna eat their friend Mares out. The girls ended up painting Syntax blue to try and trick Murga and they team up with Captain Kalau to get the mayor back. But he betrays them and Murga wrecks the capital. Stealing the drone that she needs and leaving our heroes trying to stop her from awakening Bagunawa, while dealing with her own personal journeys and an untrustworthy snake man who still steals any scene he's in. <sighs> I know he's bad to the bone, a dipshit, and a complete maniac who betrays the girls at the last second. But honestly, I love this guy, and I have since the first Freedom Planet, and I really should have mentioned him more in that video. Lilac's personal journey in this game is that she learns from Murga that they are the last two water dragons because the earth dragons who are currently in power enslaved their race, then genocided their race, and then lied about their race to make themselves look like the good guys. That's a lot to process, and now she has to do that while also trying to stop Murga from wiping out all the people she loves. There's a moment or two where the bad guys are like, hey, you should join up, you're a water dragon, you should be into this. She's like, oh yeah! You know what's better than losing one family to a genocidal maniac and a worm-shaped Death Star? Losing two families to a genocidal maniac and a worm-shaped Death Star. Okay, gonna put you down for a maybe- ah! Like, seriously, why would she ever join you? Like, come on, how's that even a question? But, you know, Lilac is still hurting from all this because she really doesn't want to be the last of the water dragons. And when she realizes that Murga gave her the sugar-coated version of what happened, because, man, when you get to those audio logs... My maid Perlis agrees and she's one of them. Fortunately, she's one of the good ones. 
Islands. Spirits know some of these ocean dwellers need to learn their place. Oh yeah, they're going there. So yes, Lilac has to stop Murga, but the truth has definitely shaken her a bit and it's really rough for her. I like the scene between her and the Magister, where they're talking about the situations and the actions of the Earth Dragons. I like how the Magister kind of defends his people's actions at first, and he tries to reason with Lilac that since she was once a thief and had the steel to survive, she should understand that his people needed to slaughter hers for them to survive. Which is a reach and a half, asshole, but I like this because it gives the Magister a bit of an arc. And it's not just have him be the wise old guy again or something like that. His throne is built on his people's sins, and although he is a good person, he is still going to take his people's side, believing their lies about what happened, before then going and doing his own research for himself. And I love that he learns the truth from a gardening journal of all things, because it was written by a water dragon and had little inserts of what was happening at the time. That is really damn historically accurate, because history is determined by the victor, and that of course means good old fashioned book burning. And after that, him and Lilac actually convince the others to make peace with Murga. And I like this, it's actually kind of like a little arc between the two of them, it's pretty cool. Carol has not seen her sister in years, so when she heads up to stop an attempted robbery slash full blown aerial warfare at the museum, she's pretty shocked to see her sister being the one behind the attack. From this point on, she's pretty much laser focused on her mission to find her sister and bring her back from Murga's side no matter how bad of a situation it actually puts the others in. She eventually apologizes for all that, and her friends definitely tease her for it for a while, you know, after they almost decapitate her for pulling a carol. And eventually she learns that her sister was only trying to protect her from Murga, as the payment for working for her was Carol's safety. Mila's main conflict is that she learns from Serpentine that she was originally bred to be one of Brevin's war dogs. Yeah, I know, I can feel the Mila villain art coming and I can't be happier. But for now, she's worried that that means she's a monster, which, thankfully, her friends pretty much shoot down that notion immediately. I like that, Mila's a good pup who wouldn't hurt anybody unless they deserved it. No point trying to stretch out some sort of drama when there's no way in hell she'd ever turn evil. Or would she? <laughs> Nira's stuff was a little confusing on my first playthrough. I think the scene with Eskel flirting with her kind of threw me off, but after another playthrough, it's pretty obvious that it's the Ice Queen melting type plot. At first, they're the cold, calculated badass who's also kind of a turd, and then slowly but surely she becomes a cold, calculated badass who's also your friend. I like this in stories, and you know, it hurts seeing her watch the only home she's ever had taken away by Murga. And then when Carol comes back, we find out the reason she was so pissed is because she was the most hurt by Carol leaving. She really does grow to appreciate her friends, and it was really sweet by the end when we're watching her interact all friendly with Carol and Mila. Oh, yeah, Eskel is another dude who betrays the girls. I'm not really sure why, it's something about being an outcast even though he's an earth dragon. I think I missed a dialogue box somewhere. I don't know, Askel's pretty cool, I just not really had much reason to bring him up yet. Though he is voiced by Piccolo, so hey, that's cool. Well, at some point in the game, we meet back up with Spade, and thankfully, he's chilled out a lot since the last game. Though, I am willing to bet that this is just what he's normally like when he's not out looking for his dad's killer. Spade this time around is more like the cooler older cousin that you almost never see. Mostly because he's in and out of jail, of course. But he does actually help the girls a lot in this story, you know, before betraying them and running off with Syntax. These girls are gonna have some serious trust issues after this game, bro. It's a conga line of betrayal in the story. Well, the girls end up failing to prevent Murga from awakening Bakunawa. However, with the help of Serpentine, they're actually able to fly up and stop Murga and bring an end to her conquest. After fighting through the ship, it's time to face Murga, but not before one last attempt at peace that she quickly dashes out. After a grueling battle against Murga and her many different moon-themed weapons, the ship starts to collapse around our heroes with them escaping once the ship reaches the ocean, with Murga nowhere to be found. The game ends with the Magister giving the villain's community service instead of a harsher punishment, due to the, uh, complicated events that led up to this rebellion. In fact, he even steps down from his position out of respect for the truth about the Earth Dragons being brought to light. The game ends with Lilac going off to hunt for Murga, with the other girls joking around and wondering when they'll see her again. 
And that's the ending, unless you got all the audio logs. If you have all the audio logs when you fight Murga, the ship actually doesn't collapse just yet, and the message is played for Murga from her beloved Cordelia. Cordelia was the woman in the audio logs who was actually an Earth Dragon princess who defected to the Water Dragons after learning of the Earth Dragon's sins. She eventually fell in love with Murga and became one of the only people to really understand who Murga was under all that super soldier junk. Cordelia actually acted as a bridge of peace between the Water and Earth Dragons. But of course, that's when the Earth Dragons betrayed the Water Dragons again, and that's when they sealed Murga using the Kingdom Stone. And the transmission we're seeing right now is actually her final message to Murga, but it's too jumbled up to hear what she's saying. Murga is heartbroken to see her beloved again, but before the girls can convince Murga that another genocide isn't what Cordelia would have wanted, Syntax comes online and takes over Bakunawa completely, leading us to a truly evil final level, where you're tested with this current puzzle which really isn't too bad until a certain kitty cat won't just- can't just get in the- Carol? They say there are many ways to skin a cat. And I'll gladly try every one of them if you don't- After getting through the puzzle, we are met with the true final boss, who's almost impossible to defeat due to her healing abilities, but Murga comes in and shuts that shit down for our heroes, leading them to defeat the monster and cause the ship to finally crash. But not before Lilac is damaged and Murga is seen jumping to her rescue. The ending from then on is pretty much the same, with the addition of a post credit scene showing the jumbled message all cleaned up, and the reveal that Princess Cordelia is still alive and working on some plan. Oh man, this story is good. Everything from the plot, to the writing, to the character interactions, it's all just really solid. And I was really feeling all of the emotions that were coursing through our characters. And a lot of that is thanks to the voice acting. It's really well done, and every voice in their deliveries really fit each of the characters. And hey, there wasn't a single audio flub this time. Not that the one or two in the first game really bothered me or anything, it's just... I just noticed there wasn't any, and honestly, I was just kind of impressed, you know, like I was with the other 99.9% .9 of the game. And you know, that's Freedom Planet 2, a game that's honestly one of my favorites from recent memory. I really love this game, bro. It takes everything that made the original good, and it turned it up to get rid of the bad and amplify that good. Like really, if I ever see a list of the best 2D platformers ever made and Freedom Planet 2 isn't on that list, then you might as well rip that shit up, because I don't want to hear it. If you love 2D platformers, and triply so if you're a Sonic fan, I absolutely recommend this game. It's just... It... Well, you know what I'm gonna say. Alright, so last time I ended off the video with this dumb joke about the bird guard and yelling slurs or something on a TV show, and I kind of had a sequel to that joke plan that was maybe like his cousin coming onto a Joe Rogan style podcast that my character had to make after the original got my show and himself cancelled. But you know, screw that idea, boys. We gotta talk about the Mila villain arc. Look, I know I was half joking last time, but there's just too many signs in this new game, man. She's coming up with alternate identities, she laughed maniacally at least three separate times, and even at the end of the game, she says she'll go full villain mode just to bring Lilac back. This is... well, I'm gonna say probably, you know, just to save my ass later. But this is probably gonna happen. But how? What's gonna set her off, I wonder? Simple. You know the whole being bred for war thing? Well, maybe Mila wasn't the only- well, I know she's not the only one, but follow me here. Maybe Mila wasn't the only one. That's right. Her evil twin, Keela. That's right. Kill plus Mila, Keela, or Killa, kill, whatever, comes to Avalise and captures and tortures her friends as Mila resolves to hunt down Keela and save Avalise. But she's not her usual self this time, as Mila has had enough of these bad guys doing bad things. So she goes full Punisher mode, in this all new 3D platformer with potty mouth language, violent alchemy based weaponry, and a kick tushy rock soundtrack, where Mila unleashes her beast within, and slaughters Keela's forces till she reaches and pumps her beams into her si- oh, wow, that could have came out right- ow, damn it, I made it worse. After destroying Keela, Mila releases her friends and they're happy to see her, until she raises her beams at them and she vows to rule all of Avalis. And then it jump cuts to Mila in her room, where it's revealed to have all just been a terrible dream that Mila was having. Then she looks over at Mr. Stumpy and they laugh and laugh till the camera starts to pan towards the window, 
where we see fire and brimstone raining down. And the reveal that it was all real. It was all real. Hey, wait. Who the fuck are, hey, hey, what are you doing in my house? No, no, wait, no, no. Stop!